Well, correct, absolutely. <laughs> <from them. laughs> just in case, I, I don't know, you just got a treat there. Yes. I, I would. So, uh, I'm sorry to think so, if you don't like that sort of thing, but that's what you're going to get. Um, I must say, no public money was spent on the design or creation of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I asked the National Order Office, um, yeah, it's actually a slide, I'll leave that for a bit longer. Um, I asked the National Order Office um, for examples of success, and they, they sent an email yesterday that said this. I am afraid that our teams are finding it considerably harder to find, identify some success stories compared to when they were asked to find examples of failure. Uh, this, 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 um, this was in response to an email from me, uh, actually a conversation, and then an email I know, an e internal email went round saying, because of course I'm one of those people who prepares very far in advance. Um, <laughs> it said, another urgent request from Richard Bacon. And anyway, this is what they said. Um, and I do want to talk about success, because I've been ordered to by Andrew and Charlotte, and I'm sure I will. But I, I am, and further that, I'm not going to pick it up on this cheap jibe about my book, um, because actually we on the PAC do look at failure. And I do have a book, uh, that book that I wrote, Conundrum, is really about failure, don't deny it. Um, and I have another book about success, I just haven't actually written it yet. And I'm much more concerned about housing, so my book on housing will come out before my book on... Uh, I am my book on world peace, and then my book on success in government. But I am very interested in this question, and the truth is that parliamentarians, auditors, journalists, universities, business schools, think tanks, trade associations, government bodies, everybody has asked this question, and most of the answers are roughly the same. Oh my god, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to shout If you don't know what you want, or what you want to keep changing, or you can't come up with the required money for the project, or there's no one in charge of the project, or you keep changing who's in charge, or the person who's supposed to be in charge doesn't really call the shots, or the person at the top of the business doesn't care about the project, and you don't focus on what the actual benefits of the business is, and you don't regularly talk to the people who have to use the system, and you don't constantly check progress, or you have an unrealistic timetable, you try to run before you can walk, or you fail to test the system before you launch it, and you don't provide enough training, you don't have a plan B in case things go wrong, you try to bite off more than you can chew in one go, or if you don't realise the bigger of the project, the greater the chances, this is why it won't work, that hasn't stuck out too far. Um, <laughs> the greater the chances of being overtaken by events or new technology or lo new legislation, so many things can go wrong there. Uh, or you don't realise that you may not have the skills you need to deliver the project, or you don't realise some suppliers are quite capable of telling you they can deliver when they can't. Then, don't be surprised if you end up with a mess that is way behind shed that damages your organisation, that traumatises your staff, costs much more than it's supposed to, and doesn't work. We have this thing called cost parity. This is now a celebrated question. Martin Cobb of the Treasury Board of Canada, this is actually the Chaos University in Standish Group, he said, we know why projects fail. We know why projects fail. We know how to prevent that failure. So, why do they still fail? Well, it's not for one to try, we have, I think I'll do this again. This is since 1968, so it's, it's selective, it's not a whole lot. The filter report of 68 in Derek Rayner Efficiency Unit 79, the Financial Management Mission of 82, very good one actually, do we do? Next steps in 1987, continuity and change in 94, basically reverse next steps. 1990, there's a chart in 95, taking forward continuity and change, modernising government. 98, Gershon Efficiency Review 2004, Civil Service Reform, Delivery and Values 2004, Civil Service Reform, Delivery and Values, one year off. <laughs> Capability Review 2005, put in the front line first, smarter government. The Civil Service Reform Plan 2012, the Civil Service Reform Plan, one year on. The Civil Service Capabilities Plan, the Civil Service Capabilities Plan 2014, refresh. They're all to-do lists, basically. That's what they are, they're all to-do lists. I think, and that's just if you go back to uh, next step, if you go back to continuity and change, it's like the last 20 years, it's roughly one white paper or one big proposal every couple of years for the last 20 years. My contention is, if to-do lists were going to solve the problem, we would have solved it by now. What's the answer after 50 years of effort, as John Manzoni told us a few weeks ago in the actually last year, I think. This is quoted in one of the reform books, so you want to get that book. Um, I'm trying to promote Andrew Sales. There is a lack of distributive capability in white It's obviously they are June 15 and 14 is when he said that. But we do see success, and there are some recent successes. The automatic enrolment of workplace pensions, which went very well indeed. There was a good behavioural design for that. The introduction of the state pension was well managed. The Syrian Brotherhood of Persons Resettlement Program was a very good example of why it will deliver something at extremely high speed when it's very urgent to do so. Actually, the same is true of emergency operational requirements, um, urgent operational requirements, ULRs, and the Ministry of Defence, although it was valued for money is a separate point, but in terms of delivering it, it got done very, very quickly. Delivering free exactly schools, uh, 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 education for three and four-year-olds. Now, there may be a question about whether the middle classes were a bit quicker off the mark than the rest, and the extent to which it reached 
um, the most vulnerable groups, but it was very effectively and quickly done. Increasingly effective in this sort of tax collection, DOTAS, declaration of tax avoidance schemes, that radically changed the cost and benefits of people coming forward with uh, new schemes, and it made a significant difference to HMRC. The Department for Education State Strategy, this was some years ago, I'm not quite sure whether that was mostly due to Michael, who's not with us today, or due to John Thompson, and he was Finance director there, but if you, if you compare the DfE estates metrics with, uh, we've now heard all the whole monogram has been moved, but um, the, the, if you compare the DfE, DfE metrics with, with, I think it was DCMS, the foot, funny enough, the football association, uh, anyway, somebody to do with football, not that I'm an expert on football. Um, there were, were huge differences, and, and Department of Education came way at the top there. Transport for London, the Oyster Car. You never hear about it because it's a great success. The one time it hit the papers was one Saturday afternoon when it failed to take money, and then it was all over the newspapers. Mostly you don't hear about it because it's a success. Crossroad, huge success, expansion of the academies. Whatever people think of the academies, we've, we've had our criticisms of the academies, but mostly they've, they've gone, well, they, they, they are varied. But some of the most compelling evidence we have ever seen from any witnesses on anything was on academies. Uh, and the same with establishing the free schools. I mean, it has liberalised and opened up things. Apprenticeships, we have national apprenticeship service. Simon Moore, one of the most passionate witnesses we've ever had. And of course, the London 2012 Olympics, which the Association of Project Management described as an intellectual gold mine, and I don't think that's no mistake. The question really is, what is the cause? What is the cause of all this failure and all this success? As Bill Clinton nearly said, it's behaviour, stupid. In other words, we need to ask ourselves, where does our behaviour come from? Consider the following descriptions. Schmoozing, scheming, consensus building, mediating conflicts, developing trust, abusing trust, mutual fear, total domination, reconciliation under the pressure of circumstances, the development of rivalries, the repairing of ruling coalitions. I know Sarah Jane had a little bit to do with that in her last job. Which of these behaviours do you recognise? I would think you probably recognise all of them, and yet they are all well-observed and well-documented behaviours of chimpanzees. In other words, primates. We are social primates. That's what we do. Franz de Waal, the Dutch-American primatologist, said the roots of politics are older than humanity. Primitive tribes compete for food and shelter, and they discovered there were two options basically. You can either kill each other or you can collaborate to deal with other threats. You might say to the tigers, will you mammoths, whatever it is. Aggression and reconciliation, not one or the other, aggression and reconciliation are deeply, deeply, deeply wired into us. Translate that into an office environment, into a factory, into a parish meeting uh, or government department. The behaviour is still there, they're still pretty wide, they just manifest themselves differently. Territory, security, insecurity, status, hierarchy, have heard any of those? You get what we call human behaviour. The roots are very deep seated. <coughs> Franz Waal's question, how do people actually behave, is one I think we should spend a lot more time pretending to. So, turn the nudge unit, I had this conversation, in fact it was Ian Watmore's surprise answer to my question when we misunderstood each other at the broad committee, it made me realise I might be onto something. When I said, you've got this great nudge unit, why don't you use it to actually not just point out to taxpayers to get them to pay tax more quickly, which is Gus's favourite example, Gus McDonald's favourite example. Why don't you point it inwards to the behaviour of ministers and civil servants and parliamentarians? Well, that's a good idea, he said. And um, so um, that's, I think, what we ought to do. Father Cloudsworth, of course, said war is merely the continuation of politics by other means. That's always seems to me to have a very obvious corollary, that politics is the continuation of war by other means. In other words, politics is reconciliation behaviour. There's a book called The Silence of Constitutions by Michael Fay, which I think is a profoundly insightful book. It came out in uh, the early 90s. He talks about gaps and abeyances. He calls them tacit agreements to maintain deep and unsettled issues in a state of genuine ambiguity. We always say don't even go there, don't make a conversation. We're usually talking about something that's frustrating or sensitive or absurd, but which can't easily be changed without unacceptable damage to the system that we're operating. In. in other words, ambiguity has its uses, especially in politics. The light bulb moment for me was when I heard, uh, I, read, I read, read Ross Anderson, who's a pre professor of computing at Cambridge, say this, project managers must forever be closing down options early, while political managers try to keep all options open forever. Another light bulb moment was uh, Terry Levy, the former boss of um, Tesco. I hate to say the words <coughs> politics in, in this uh, <laughs> But it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a thing for his book then. He said this, project management and the democratic process are not a good mix. And James Bach, who's a leading software expert and proponent to explore and testing, said everything that really, ha really interesting happens on software projects, he could just as easily have said projects, eventually comes down to people. 
the capacity for ambiguity versus the need for clarity is at the heart of all this. Ian Walmer, again, this was a huge light bulb moment when he was talking about the project failure. He said, it's very rare that the technology is a problem in these so called IT projects. In nearly, it is nearly always the case that either the project management has been done incorrectly or the policy ambition is too ambitious. The reason why IT is the place where it gets found out is because that is where all the codification of what has been decided finally comes to fruition. And this was the light bulb moment for me. He said, and machines are pretty bad at handling ambiguity. <laughs> and the ambiguity is essential for human survival and at the core of politics. In other words, the thing that is most essential in politics is the thing that is most toxic for the delivery of successful projects. In other words, it's really quite surprising that anything goes well. <laughs> the, key lesson, the key lesson from the Olympics, and it is an intellectual goal, mind. David Burke said this, the one outstanding feature of the whole organization, from the ODA through to the delivery partner, CLM, and the contractors was to be worth hard to generate, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, keep that one as a separate bill, one source of truth. We need to generate and recognize one source of truth. That was David Birch. Here are some questions to ponder on visibility. Does visibility and being watched closely make things easier or more difficult? I happen to think in the case of the Olympics, the fact that we knew there was something wrong with the aquatic center and there were problems with it six years beforehand, the fact that they had a very, very capable management team with serious domain expertise and that they knew they were being watched and they paid the right people the right money to get it done, made a significant uh, difference. But visibility, you will all know, people have arguments about whether gateway reviews being published make things better or worse. But it's an interesting question. Does it make things more, more easy or more difficult? Are bad projects, in other words, like anaerobic bacteria, can they only survive in the dark with a lack of oxygen? I think, personally, that good projects uh, build muscle by being tested and being shown that they are intellectually sound. And mostly, if you're forced to defend something, you get better at it. Peter Lilly used to say this about going through cabinet committees. Sometimes it's only by testing to destruction an idea in front of your colleagues who are completely um, coming at it afresh that you realize what, what deep flaws it might contain. Are good projects like the best athletes? Do they train the most? There are probably 50 or 100 sprinters who can do the 10 or 100 meters in under 10 seconds. But it's always the same 8 to 10 to 12 at any one time who end up in the in the uh, Olympic final. The same is true of the world's top tennis players. It's always the top four or six who end up in the, the Grand Slam finals. Is that because of the, the fact that they are better than the others? The fact that they train harder and work harder and are more mentally focused? Here's some instincts of questions that arise for us on our committee. Who is in charge? These are things which, when we're looking at stuff that comes before us, and when we're trying to ask ourselves why it's going to fail or whether it's going to be a success, who's in charge? Has the SRO changed frequently or too frequently? Has the timetable been for testing been compressed? That's always an enormous red flag and a big alarm bell uh, for me. It doesn't matter what the project is. Does the project have all the right skills in finance, in HR, in IT, in legal, um, procurement, uh, and in, of course in project management? Is the capacity to be an intelligent client still there? Because if it is, that's good news. If it's been lost, if, it's been, if that itself has been outsourced, which we saw uh, in a number of cases years ago, but still seen from time to time, then that's a big, big problem in terms of are the costs understood, are the risks understood? And to, to Bernard's final point is about risk aversion. John Horn made this point, an original point for me. He talks in his book about the fact that um, uh, people often talk about civil services being risk averse, when in fact, very often, of course, we know that that's sometimes true, but very often it's the case, he says, their risk ignorant. The civil service will sometimes take enormous risks without being aware that it's doing so. And in particular, of course, because they're egged on by ministers who are completely ignorant. And therefore, it seems to me, and I, I have this out with John Mancini as often as I possibly can, I was talking to Tony Meigs of the Infrastructure and Projects Authority last week in Oxford about it, and I was doing a, a thing there. Uh, it seems to me it should be uh, absolutely in our meat and drink for every member of parliament. We know that with the, for 91% of the time, the ministers are coming from a very small pool. They're called members of parliament. Of course, peers come in from time to time, but most people come in as members of parliament, become minister, so that's where they mostly come from. So knowing that that's the case, it seems to me if you want more success, we should embed every member of parliament in the knowledge that there's quite a likelihood that at some point they'll become a minister, just what the difference is between risk aversion and risk sequence, just what it requires to do something successfully. We start to do that as a matter of norm. If that's the, the new normal, if that's the default position, it's just possible we'll start having even more success, which my constituents as taxpayers and we all as citizens deserve. Thank you very much.